good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, starting over for those who might have heard me. Uh, and almost afternoon on the West Coast. Uh, I'm Dr. Richard Wender. I'm the chair of the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to moderate this panel on frontiers in cancer screening. And we're going to focus today on emerging technology, uh, blood tests that can screen for multiple cancers or multi-cancer blood tests, uh, and what their potential role may be in screening for cancer. And we have an uh, exciting panel to, uh, to uh, both present to you and then join me in a moderated discussion at the end. I have no conflicts of interest relevant to this topic. So a couple of housekeeping sessions before we get started with presentations. Uh, we're gonna wait to address any questions uh, or comments that you may have until all the presentations have concluded. Uh, so here's how you can participate. Uh, uh, ask questions or share your comments by clicking the Q&A icon on the bottom right of your screen. So that's how to put in your comments. You can do it the whole time uh, through all the presentations. Uh, so we'll look forward to that. Let me introduce the, the tremendous panel that we have uh, today in the order that you're going to hear them. Uh, first of all is Dr. Stephen Skates. He's an associate professor of medicine and biostatistics at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. As you'll hear, he's really dedicated his life to the role of the early detection of cancer uh, through blood testing and serial blood testing and, and uh, molecular biomarkers uh, with a, an eye towards balancing benefits and harms. Uh, following Dr. Skates will be Dr. Ruth Etzioni, who's a full professor in the program in biostatistics, the Division of Public Health Sciences at the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center, um, where she holds the Rosalie and Harold Ray Brown Endowed Chair. Uh, Dr. Etzioni has uh, really been one of the leading scientists in the area of cancer screening. Uh, she's on multiple guideline writing panels uh, and has uh, really been at the forefront of thinking about the science uh, of screening technologies. And finally, Dr. Sue Horton, who is the professor of global health economics at the University of Waterloo and a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Uh, you may be familiar with her work on the uh, economics of nutrition, uh, but more recently, she's been working in non-communicable diseases within low and middle income countries, uh, where she has an extensive amount of work uh, in looking at uh, uh, what kinds of health interventions uh, make sense and are cost effective uh, in multiple settings. And we'll uh, chime in on her uh, early work in thinking about the cost effectiveness of these emerging technologies. So just to remind you, uh, Q&A, you can put in your questions as we go. We'll address them at the end of the panel. Click the icon, Q&A icon on the bottom right of your screen. Uh, and we'll look forward to the discussion period. But uh, for now, let's get started with our first presentation from Dr. Stephen Skates will be followed immediately by Ruth Etzioni and then Sue Horton. Thanks. Thanks, Rich, for that kind introduction. I am uh, Stephen Skates. Uh, I am at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. I am uh, an associate professor and investigator on early detection of cancer. This uh, talk is a sequence of trials for the early detection of ovarian cancer it's our uh, odyssey from 1985 to the current date, uh, 2021. Um, and I'm honored uh, to have been invited uh, by Karen and uh, the Virtual Prevent Cancer Dialogue Committee uh, to present to you uh, on, on early detection of ovarian cancer. I want to acknowledge uh, a, a large group of collaborators. These are the main people, but by no means the only people. Uh, and funding from multiple resources, both in the US and the UK, uh, enabled uh, these studies. Uh, my declarations of interest, uh, the, biggest, um, dis, uh, the biggest issue is that I'm an eternal optimist for early detection. Uh, and I think if, if there's any sway or bias, it's coming really from that. Uh, I'm also a co-investigator on UKC Tox, which is the main trial that I'll be presenting here. I've been a principal investigator on the Cancer Genetics Network Ovarian Cancer Screening Trial and a co principal investigator on the GOG199 trial. And there's been 30, over 30 years commitment to ovarian cancer screening. 
Um, and so that's where the conflicts really arise. But I am a co-developer of the risk of ovarian cancer algorithm with Ian Jacobs. Um, that has been licensed uh, by our institutions to Abcodia, and I'm consultant for the following companies. However, none of these interests will impact my presentation today. The outline of the talk is that we'll talk about early CA125 screening trials, uh, a development from there on what, what we refer to as the risk of ovarian cancer algorithm based on longitudinal CA125, where essentially, each woman serves as her own control, and that's much more powerful uh, than having a single threshold for CA125. I'll talk about uh, trials, screening trials using ROCA, uh, the design of the big trial and the mortality analysis in that trial and where we're going uh, in, in my vision for early detection of ovarian cancer from there. Uh, the first trial I was involved with was the Stockholm screening trial. Really, it's a, a Swedish-wide screening trial from over six years, from 1986 to 1992. I joined MGH in 1986, and my first um, project was on reviewing an application to the NCI for a special a small business innovation research grant that Senecor, who had licensed CA125 from Dana-Farber, uh, where Bob Knapp, uh, co-discoverer of CA125 was, along with Bob Bast. And they discovered it in the late 70s and managed to create it in the uh, early, uh, create it, uh, create an assay to it, uh, for it, and uh, apply it uh, for second look operations in women. And it was uh, FDA approved for that indication. And then they uh, envisaged uh, we could use it more broadly for early detection. And so uh, they uh, identified Sweden as a place where there was the highest incidence of ovarian cancer in the world uh, and uh, managed to get uh, this small business innovation research grant and screened with that 5,500 women over the age of 40. And if the CA125 was greater than 35, they referred the woman to ultrasound. And in 5,500 women uh, over th roughly three years, uh, they identified 12, uh, six postmenopausal cases of ovarian cancer, conducted 12 surgeries for suspected ovarian cancers. All of them were detected by CA125. Two out of six, that's one third in early stage. So um, encouraging. Uh, and then in parallel, uh, there was the Royal London Hospital screening trial led by Ian Jacobs, and he had started a year earlier. He enrolled 22,000 women. Um, uh, they were postmenopausal, age over 45, and he did an initial prevalence screen on all 22,000 women, where his rule was if CA125 was greater than 30, they were referred to ultrasound and a CA125 every three months. And then he randomly selected 11,000 of those women uh, to return for three more annual tests. That was the Royal London Hospital study. And 28 cases were detected within one year of the last test. So if you th we're thinking of doing an annual test, that's the relevant number. And 20 out of those 28 were detected by the screen. So that's a 71% sensitivity. And combined with the ultrasound, there was a 99.9% .9 specificity, which was excellent. However, Six out of the 28 were in early stage and it was too low. So what can we do about that? What can we learn from those trials? And if you look at CA125 over time, what you see in the ovarian cancer cases is a rapidly rising uh, CA125. And this is uh, on a uh, logarithmic scale. So one to 10 is the same as going from 10 to 100. Uh, so this represents a tumor doubling time. In contrast, in other diseases, benign gynecologic and non-gynecologic diseases, uh, most of the women, when looked at over time, had a flat profile for CA125. And you could have, in, even with, and especially with no disease, you could have high levels at times, but very constant, um, no rising over time in contrast to most of the ovarian cancer cases. So that was the Stockholm trial, similar, um, uh, <clears throat> distinction between a rapidly rising CA125 in the cases identified by the red dots here, uh, uh, numbers one, three, and five, 
And in fact, number five gives us our quintessential, what we think is a, of our paradigm where we have a flat baseline and then ovarian cancer arises and then it starts to rise very rapidly, much more strongly than the fluctuations that you see over time in the women that didn't have ovarian cancer, which was the green three women, two, four, and six, uh, that had varying levels of CA125, some of them very high, but over time there was this, uh, not the rapid rise, nor the extent of the rise that we saw in the cases. And all of these in the red cases uh, of ovarian cancer were prior to the clinical detection of the disease. So this is preclinical uh, dynamics of CA125. And uh, we came up with, Ian and I came up with the idea of uh, this risk of ovarian cancer algorithm where you have a regular CA125 test and then you calculate the chance that they have this change point, this risk of, a, uh, and use that risk uh, or that change point, the probability of a risk a probability of a change point as a, as a measure of the risk of having undetected ovarian cancer. And if it's normal, you return uh, in, um, uh, in, in the standard uh, test uh, um, uh, interval of, of annual testing. If it's intermediate, you maybe repeat the CA125 in three months. And if it's elevated, you send them on to transvaginal sonography. And in that way, they uh, have a baseline, uh, you establish a baseline for each woman and look for uh, significant changes above that baseline. And, uh, and that way we, we actually, we triage by risk um, and essentially funnel those that are at highest risk for having a change point uh, that is having uh, undetected ovarian cancer into the most significant resources, which was the uh, um, ultrasound. And we implemented that uh, in a, a tr pilot trial of about uh, 14,000 women, half screened, half not. And in the first 10,000 screens, uh, we saw that about 2% ended up with elevated risk, either 1% of them by immediate uh, elevation of CA125 or uh, another uh, uh, 1% um, by an intermediate risk step or a second intermediate risk step leading up to about 2% uh, at elevated risk. And those women that are elevated risk went on to transvaginal sonography and repeat risk of ovarian cancer. And out of the two, roughly 200, about 10% uh, had a abnormality on ultrasound, which required them, uh, which led them to go to a, a referral to surgery. So out of those 22, five uh, had ovarian cancer and the, uh, the encouraging feature of that was three out of the five were early stage, which is 60% uh, instead of uh, the usual 20%. So we had a threefold increase in early stage. Now there were 17 false positives, but that gave you a positive predictive value of over 20%. Um, and this was not enough to in institute a national screening trial uh, sorry, a national screening program, but it did give us uh, preliminary evidence for uh, conducting a, a definitive trial of ovarian cancer screening with this approach. And at the time, there was a lot of negativity about ovarian cancer screening. So we had poor survival uh, or uh, annual surveillance by CA125 was ineffective. Um, or we could not prevent the disease with CA125 and ultrasound, or there were implications for screening women at high risk that were questionable, and that there was no effect of screening um, in the PLCO study, for example, which was the US study uh, that included, the O part included uh, ovarian cancer screening. So nonetheless, we conducted uh, multiple trials, and this gives you the timeline. This uh, first trial was the pilot trial that was randomized 14,000 women uh, over six years. That provided the preliminary data for the big UK trial, which is number three UKC tox. Uh, in parallel, we also did a US uh, risk of ovarian cancer algorithm trial uh, in two and a half thousand high risk women. Um, and this was through multiple uh, networks through that was sponsored by NCI. UK CTOX, a UK collaborative trial of ovarian cancer screening enrolled 200,000 women and ended up being conducted over 15 years. 
and they, half of them were randomized to screen and the other half to no screen. So we had a randomized comparison here in number three. And, and this is what I'll focus on. There's also the MD Anderson cancer study that used this uh, risk of ovarian cancer algorithm on 7,000 normal, post, uh, normal risk postmenopausal women. There was a US GOG gynecologic oncology group uh, trial where the screening arm of that trial enrolled 1,600 high risk women. And then there was a UK familiar ovarian cancer screening study uh, that enrolled 5,000 high risk women. All of them uh, published, all of them encouraging using this risk of ovarian cancer algorithm. In all of those uh, ROCA trials, there was a significant increase in early stage cancer. Um, and no other ovarian cancer screening trial had such an increase. All of them, uh, all the other ones used a single cutoff uh, for CA125, usually 35. Uh, in contrast, we individualized and personalized the test using ROCA and having each woman serve as her own control. This led to the definitive trial, the UK collaborative trial of ovarian cancer screening from 2001 to 2015. Um, I, uh, Ian Jacobs was a principal investigator along with Usha Manon and uh, four other investigators, including myself. So uh, 200,000 postmenopausal women were randomized. It took us four years. We thought we could do it in three, but it took, ended up taking four. Um, it was originally designed for eight years of annual screening and two years of follow-up from 2001 to 2011. Turns out that the women who, uh, there was a million women invited, 20% accepted, that's the 200,000. Those 200,000 were actually a healthier subgroup of, uh, than the general population. Um, and therefore they had fewer cases of ovarian cancer in the control arm that we were monitoring. And so we realized that to get the power in this study uh, that was originally intended, we had to expand the trial and we added another three years of screening and another one year of follow-up. So in the end, instead of a 10-year trial, it was a, in fact a 14-year trial. Those uh, women, uh, 200,000, uh, half of them were uh, randomized to screening, uh, half of those using the longitudinal algorithm. Uh, half of uh, another 50,000 uh, to annual ultrasound as a first line test and 100,000 to the control group where standard of care was given and no screening was done. So uh, the results of that in 2014 were a uh, unfortunately a not a significant difference, but you can see that the curves start to separate maybe around seven, between seven and eight years. Uh, and the, the, this, these curves are the mortality curves. So this is how many women died cumulatively of ovarian cancer screening from the start of the trial at time zero, uh, all the way through to 14 years uh, of, of the trial. And you can see that the screened arm, which is the red, the multimodal screening arm, which included the Roker algorithm and, and uh, followed by transvaginal sonography uh, as a second line test for those that were positive by Roker, um, had, fewer ovarian, had fewer ovarian cancer deaths than the control arm, which is shown in the blue, C for control. However, this uh, mortality difference by the Cox model uh, had a p-value of 0.1. And uh, uh, you'll know from basic statistics that we want a p-value less than 0 0.05. So it was double what we needed to get for statistical significance. However, if you uh, subdivided this um, timeline into from zero to seven years and from seven to 14 years, then you saw two different effects. There was an 8% reduction um, at uh, from zero to seven. So you can see the red curve for most of it is underneath the blue curve or at least for a large uh, fraction, but not, not by much. Uh, and that had a very wide confidence interval. But if you looked at just the second half of the curve from seven years through to 14 years, then there was a 23% reduction and that had a confidence interval from 1% to 46%. And if you combine those and you looked at a 30 year screening program, these seven years might have an 8%, but then the four, uh, seven to 14 years uh, in the rest of the screening program uh, for 23 years might have this 23% uh, reduction. And uh, when you then weighted average those out, then you get a 20% reduction 
So that's what we might predict for a long-term screening program. Uh, but with the proviso that this p-value here wasn't quite significant. However, we did also look at excluding the prevalent cases. So um, if you look at the CA125 over time for each individual case, what we found for most of the cases was these blue dots established a baseline for each woman. Uh, and this level was different for each woman. And then once they got ovarian cancer, then the CA125 started to rise rapidly until they were detected on ultrasound and then they had the surgery at the time of their um, uh, detection of the disease. And what we can uh, do is work out where that change point was. And if that change point, this is the change point from a flat baseline to a rapidly increasing CA125. If that change point was after when they first got their screen, which is by, shown by the green line here, then uh, these were um, not prevalent cases, they were incident cases, they were after the first line of screening. However, if uh, uh, the CA125 was rapidly rising right from the word go, from the first screening test, as is the case here, and then we backtrack to where the change point is likely to be, we can see that most of the uh, area where it probably was is to the left of uh, the first screening test, and therefore, this is a prevalent case. The disease was already likely there um, at the time of the first test. And so we excluded these because uh, this, these cases, these prevalent cases, have less, much less chance for screening to have an effect because the disease is already there. And when we excluded them, we then found that the average mortality reduction was 20%. And this had a p-value of 0 0.02. That is, uh, it was significant, less than 0.05. And this is the cumulative um, curves for uh, the multimodal screening and, you, and the control arm. And you can see that there is indeed a bigger separation than there was when you included all the cases. So we did an additional, five, because of the mixed message there, we did an additional five and a half years of uh, follow-up uh, the data uh, was closed in uh, 20th of June last year. Data cleaning and analysis was finished uh, in December. And then we submitted, reviewed and published uh, two days ago um, as of 12th of May uh, this year. And what we were hoping is that uh, uh, as in the prostate uh, screening with PSA trial that was done in, in Europe, uh, mortality reduction was marginal uh, on the first publication in 2009, yet with another three years, it was significant. Uh, and here it was marginal for UK CTOX, and we were hoping in five years it would be significant. Unfortunately, I have to say it was not. So that was our odyssey with UK CTOX. These are the people that did it. I'm right here at the back, but at the front is Usha Manon and Ian Jacobs who led that trial. And then where are we going from here? Longitudinal algorithms, I think, still have a role here, but an annual testing for CA125 with CA125 leads to a 10% late stage reduction, which is not sufficient to lead to mortality reduction. However, we are looking at other biomarkers uh, through the NCI's Early Detection Research Network. We're coming up with uh, algorithms that look at multiple markers over time. And we're also looking at uterine lavage as another source of a signal for the presence of tumor DNA in the uterine lavage and potentially in pap smears and looking at serum protein biomarkers. And this is through the Early Detection Research Network. And I think that has great hope uh, for early detection in normal risk wound. And I want to say thank you to all the audience and to the Prevent Cancer Foundation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ruth Etzioni. I'm a professor at the Fred Hatch Cancer Research Center and a distinguished scientist at the Center for Early Detection Advanced Research at the Knight Cancer Institute. I've been working in early detection in cancer for almost 30 years, and I'm delighted to be back at the dialogue this year. We really are at an epic point in the history of cancer early detection with the emergence of new multi-cancer early detection tests. And so today, I'd like to look forward to this new future and at the same time, 
recognize that we've been here before and think about lessons that we might be able to take from the past, from our history of cancer screening. These are my disclosures. And I'm going to start us back at ovarian cancer, truly a poster child for early detection. And thanks to Dr. Skates, you all know that ovarian cancer has a far better survival, 10-year survival of almost 90% for early stage cases, poor survival for late stage cases of only 15%. And that's almost 30 years now, a biomarker for ovarian cancer was discovered, CA125. And thanks to work by Dr. Skates and his colleagues, we were able to not only use knowledge of how this biomarker um, was elevated in ovarian cancer cases, but how it actually changed over time to develop very specific tailored tests for ovarian cancer screening that were shown to perform better than standard screens that simply used the biomarker level to identify cancer cases. And these tests were then used in the ovarian cancer screening trial, the UKC talks in the UK. And early publication, the first publication from the trial um, was very promising uh, after some delay, really showing a divergence in the mortality from ovarian cancer in screen versus control arms. But just in the last week, long-term follow-up from the trial was published, showing in fact that there was no significant difference between screen and control arms. And this is why I say I feel that we're really at um, an epic point in cancer early detection because we have now results from a large trial in a cancer that we expected based on biomarker performance to show great benefit from early detection. And so we are pausing and we're digesting these results and trying to understand why the results uh, were not significant. At the same time as we're pausing and we're contemplating the reasons for this finding, there's a pull to the excitement and exuberance of new biomarkers and new multi-cancer tests. So we really are at this point of looking forward but with a caution from the past. And this is what I'd like to explore in my presentation. And here are some of the uh, companies and the products, the early, the multi-cancer early detection products um, that you've heard about in previous uh, sessions of the dialogue. And these different tests are leveraging commonalities across cancer that are reflected in the fragments of DNA that can be identified in the circulation. And there are common hallmarks or characteristics of, of the DNA of different cancers, whether it's methylation patterns, whether it's mutation patterns, or even the sizes, the fragmentation patterns that enable these tests to find signals for multiple cancers. And here are three different tests and some of the tests not only provide a cancer signal, but also an indicator of the likely tissue of origin. So it's understandable that these tests are generating a great deal of excitement. But what do we know about these tests so far? Well, first of all, we know that they can find cancer when we know it is there. We know about their performance. The early studies of the tests have examined how well the tests can detect diagnosed cancers. Here's an early study from 2018 of the cancer seek test that shows um, the uh, sensitivity of the test um, in the middle here by cancer stage and across on the right here, the sensitivity to detect different cancer types, some of which have no screening tests in existence. And you can see that the sensitivity is certainly um, higher for later stage um, tumors than for earlier stage tumors. And this pattern is replicated for a different test. And here's a 2020 publication 
which shows that in this test, again, sensitivity increased with stage, and this test also produced a tissue, an indicator of tissue of origin. So on the left here, we have sensitivity by stage in uh, two different sets of samples, uh, very comparable. And on the right, we have the fraction correctly localized by stage. What else do we know about these tests? Well, we know that they're highly specific. So a highly specific test has a low false positive rate. And this has always been critically important in cancer screening because the majority of persons tested do not have cancer. So here's a, a little graphic just showing all the gray figures do not have cancer. And so when you're testing a population in which the vast majority actually do not have the cancer that you're seeking, then it's very possible, even if you have a specific tests, that the sheer number of false positives will outweigh the true positives. And we always want to make sure that we're controlling the fraction of false positives to true positives because that directly impacts the ratio of unnecessary biopsies to cancers detected. So we know about the performance of these tests, but we also know that policy screening decisions and whether a test ultimately does more good than harm in the population depends on, not only on performance, but on critical outcomes, such as lives saved, uh, unnecessary biopsies, and costs. And there's really a gap from performance to outcomes. Good performance does not automatically imply good outcomes. And there are three drivers of the connection between performance and outcomes that I want to spend a bit of time explaining. And they are the sensitivity to detect latent disease, the opportunity to detect early latent disease, and the curability of early disease. And I'll explain what this star means in just a moment. So sensitivity to detect latent disease. So here I'm just drawing a schematic, a timeline of a cancer from inception, detectable inception uh, through early stage and advanced stage. And I'm showing here a time point of diagnosis. And the sensitivity estimates that have been published pertain to sensitivity at this point, at the time of diagnosis. But in early detection, the relevant sensitivity is, of course, the sensitivity, the ability to detect the tumor while it is latent before it is diagnosed. And that is not actually very hard to, it's very hard to estimate, even for uh, some of the existing tests like mammograms, the, this relevant sensitivity is difficult to estimate and we have proxies for it. But this is what we really need to know. And the sensitivity to detect a cancer is not only about the sensitivity of the test, it's also about what we then do afterwards to readily and accurately confirm the presence of disease, whether it's imaging or whether it's biopsy we tend to think of those confirmation tests as being perfectly able to identify a latent cancer. But in many cases, that's not the case. So it's the combined sensitivity that really matters. Now, opportunity is the second factor, the second driver of the translation of performance to outcomes. And what, I've, what I mean by opportunity is the time that the test has to detect early latent potentially curable disease. And if you notice from the previous slide, I'll just toggle back, I shortened in this slide the duration of early stage disease to make the point that even if we have a perfectly sensitive test, if that interval is short, we may not have the opportunity to detect it with standard screening uh, strategies that screen maybe every year or every two years. And published studies tell us very little about the duration of early stage disease. And it's very difficult to identify, even when you have data from screen cohorts, you can really only learn about this duration 
when you have data on screen and interval detected cancers from screened cohorts. And many of the cancers that multi-cancer early detection tests are um, diagnosing, those cancers have never been screened for, and we have very little information about this duration of the curable interval or the treatable interval, um, and we have very little information about the opportunity. But if we don't have opportunity, then even a highly sensitive test may not induce a, uh, a benefit. And the last factor here is the curability of early disease. And with the star here, I mean the curability of those cancers that are shifted earlier by screening. Um, is their survival also going to be correspondingly shifted? We tend to assume that this will be the case. In fact, this is one of the, really the foundations of early detection research. But we have to recognize that the assumption that shifting a case earlier will provide a corresponding survival advantage, this assumption is making another assumption, which is that early stage cases are just earlier versions of late stage cases. And we know that that's not always the case. For example, in ovarian cancer, late stage cases tend to be type two cancers that are more aggressive, and early stage cases tend to are more likely to be type one cancers that are more slow growing. And so it's not clear that the early stage survival is really reflective of what we might expect for cases shifted to an early stage by screening. And this is why we need trials, because it's very hard to address each of these drivers and to learn about them individually. But when we have a trial, the trial tells us whether they're all coming together to, um, to, to, to translate performance to outcomes. And if there's one take home message from today, it's that multi-cancer early detection, while performance is promising, that there is still a high degree of uncertainty about whether this translation will happen. Because published studies give us information about sensitivity, but not to detect latent disease. They don't give us information about opportunity. And we know that there's uncertainty in addition about curability because the key assumption that shift stage shifted cases will be as curable as current early stage cases is still an assumption. So talking about trials and what they might and how they might inform about the translation of performance to outcomes, what might we, if we look to the ovarian, to the UKC TRUX trial, you know, what might we learn? about sensitivity, opportunity, and curability. So we, we know that there's a, a proxy for sensitivity um, showed a very high sensitivity of 85% for the um, algorithm used to, um, that used CA125. But it relied on ultrasound imaging of the ovaries to move to biopsy. And we know that early type two aggressive tumors actually begin in the fallopian tubes. So the sensitivity of this mixed modality screening to detect latent disease, there may be, the data may be suggesting a question about that. How about the opportunity? In the screening arm, the incidence of stage four disease was reduced by almost 25%, but stages three and four, sorry, that should be three and four, were reduced by only 10%. So there may have been opportunity to detect disease before it reached stage four, but there may not have been opportunity to detect disease before it reached stage three. And as for the curability, well, there was a 10% reduction in stage three plus four incidence, but no difference in disease-specific mortality. So in addition to other questions that are beginning, that people are thinking about regarding the trial related potentially to design uh, uh, questions and follow-up questions, the trial really suggests that maybe one or more of these drivers needs to be more closely looked at with respect to ovarian cancer screening. Well, trials are not the only way that we can learn about these drivers. Um, and I'll note that if, the, if we could do a trial, the, it would take many years. Trial, screening trials 
traditionally have taken at least 10 years or more to provide results. And unfortunately, there's, even though they're needed, they're rarely the final word. They're complex to interpret um, and, and, and always, always require further investigation and analysis. Prospective screening study, studies um, are another approach to try to give us a window into some of these drivers. And what in prospective screening studies, there is no control group, but a group of uh, patients, a group of volunteers are essentially screened using the technology and then followed over time. But since there's no control group, it's hard to make conclusions. And modeling analyses, uh, as I've noted, are um, um, there's a lot that we don't know about the uh, um, the, the, the duration of curability of many of these cancers. And so modeling studies are subject to information gaps and make many assumptions, but they can give some potentially some ballpark predictions uh, require tremendous transparency so people understand the, um, the caveats of their results. Here's a recent prospective study, a uh, follow-on to the cancer seek, um, in which 10,000 women were given the test um, and after this test does not give a tumor of origin, a, tu a site of origin, a tissue of origin. And so um, the, the, um, after two positive tests, patients were given full body PET CT scans. And uh, 26 cancers were detected by the test. Um, and uh, you can see the other results of the study. Other cancers were detected, but not by the test. And these kinds of studies can give somewhat of a window into this question of latent sensitivity and opportunity for detectability. But what they don't tell us is where the cancers detected had their fate changed by being detected. And so they can only be suggestive and they cannot be conclusive. Here's a new modeling study um, with an interface that um, we've uh, produced that is um, currently um, provisionally accepted. Um, and, and what you can do with this is, um, is, a, is a, an interface that um, can be used to actually configure a test here. We've configured a test for five different cancers. We provide the sensitivity, the localization accuracy, and the reduction in mortality that might be expected per cancer. And then we produce several useful outcomes, but they really are only ballpark predictions because that reduction in mortality is at this point uh, anyone's guess. We have some bounds from trials, but uh, this is just to give people a sense of the numbers um, uh, um, of some of these uh, uh, relevant outcomes that we might be trying to get our hands on, thinking about in the absence of further data. So uh, I have a couple more slides. I wanna just generally wrap up and then I want to make just a couple more points here. Um, clearly, this is a critically important technology advance, but the complexities of early detection are as present as ever. Because we have uh, more prevalence across multiple cancers, we expect relatively few exposed to an unnecessary biopsy per cancer detected, but a more complex confirmation process. And guidance is really still lacking about how this should be done and it probably be, will be highly variable as these tests roll out. The tests will likely detect some cancers that we do not currently screen for, as was found in the Detect A study, but it's unclear whether their fate will be altered. And we really, at this point, at this epic moment, need to heed the timing and message of the ovarian cancer screening story. But I just want to mention that we want to also learn from the prostate cancer story, and let me explain what I mean by that. This is a curve from the SEER program that shows mortality for prostate cancer um, before and after the introduction of PSA screening. Uh, PSA, I have this freight train here. Um, we have technology rushing at us like a freight train and that's exactly what happened with PSA. It was approved by the FDA for monitoring, not for screening in 1986, rapidly disseminated into the population for screening um, as well as for diagnostic and surveillance purposes. In 1993, um, the US trial started, also a European trial. And so we were left without trial results, but a population adopting a new technology and changes in outcomes and um, many questions about whether this was due to screening, treatment or both, was screening working or wasn't it? And we have not tracked the rollout 
of prostate cancer screening. And we had to retrospectively construct it to be able to learn from the population. Eventually, the trial results were published in 2009. They were not conclusive, and the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force disapproved, um, recommended against PSA screening in 2011, has since softened their recommendation, but the controversy still continues. And I believe that that really was a function of not tracking the rollout of PSA screening. When you have data from the population, you cannot help but try to make conclusions from it. But the population is the ultimate uncontrolled experiment. And so we are strongly urging the uh, initiation and development of a data resource to track the utilization and outcomes of these tests while we await further results regarding harm, benefit, and cost, which may be years down the road. We need to understand if these tests are affecting outcomes, if they're affecting health disparities, if they're benefiting patients, and we'll need to know that sooner rather than later. So with that, I'll end here. I'd like to thank my collaborators. I'd like to thank my support. Um, our calculator is up. Um, encourage um, any feedback uh, if, you, if you have a chance to take a look at it. And thank you to the Brabant Cancer Foundation for the opportunity to share this presentation with you. Thanks for inviting me to talk on this very interesting topic, and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions at the end. Uh, please just note I'm an economist. I have not got any medical training. Uh, I don't have any relevant financial relationships, and I will be drawing on a paper with my co-authors, Joe Lipscomb, Albert Kuo, and Christian Tomasetti, which has been submitted to cancer. In, in my short presentation, I would like to give you a little primer on health economics or a refresher, if you've done it before, um, and talk about the cost effectiveness of the existing cancer screening in the US and how that might compare to the cost effectiveness of a multi-cancer blood test. And I have one slide at the end where I will speculate about the policy implications. So my short refresher on health economics. Um, Needs are many, but resources are few. There are many interventions in health that we cannot necessarily afford to use to intervene with all of them. So we need to pick the, the highest priorities. So one way to do that might be to think about the cost per death averted. You know, that's, that makes somewhat intuitive sense. Uh, on the other hand, we might want to modify that and think about uh, lives saved in very elderly people having a different value from those saved in babies uh, because the number of life years that are gained differs, so cost per life year saved. But there again, some interventions may substantially improve the quality of life without necessarily changing life expectancy. And that's where these qualies come in, quality adjusted life years. Um, and it's a metric that's often used to set health priorities. So if we can calculate the cost per quality, what's good value? Um, so the answer is it depends on the country. Um, rich countries can afford a higher uh, number of, cost of interventions with more cost per quality, whereas very poor countries can only afford a limited basket of interventions with a lower cost per quality. And the threshold um, that's been recommended is using something like one times per capita income of the country. So for the US, the threshold that's commonly used is 50,000 US. Anything, any health intervention costing less than $50,000 per quality is considered good value. And that particular number was chosen for no other very good reason than in 1950, it was the highest cost intervention that Medicaid would pay for, which was kidney dialysis at that time. Um, and a similar metric is used for the UK, um, 30,000 pounds per quality. Um, and for poor countries, uh, obviously the figures used are a lot lower because the country income level is lower. So, um, So cost effectiveness methods have been used when 
generating choices about cancer screening. So obviously we only uh, would use interventions that are effective, but then there are various additional choices. Uh, when doing cancer screening, we need to decide which groups should be screened, who is at the highest risk and therefore most important to screen. What ages should we use for the screening? How frequently should we screen? And cost effectiveness can help us make those kinds of decisions to fine tune our cancer screening programs. So here are existing programs and in a second I will show you information about the costs and cost effectiveness of these different screening programs. And then we can compare that to this potential multi-cancer blood test that might be available in future. So here I've calculated the what I call the annualized cost of a screening program, uh, because that's going to be important for governments when they budget for these programs. And how I got this is to calculate the cost of the screen itself divided by the interval over which you are screened. So breast cancer mammograms cost a couple of hundred dollars and people are screened every two years. So the annualized cost is a hundred dollars. And let's compare that to colorectal, where if you do a colonoscopy, the recommended interval is every 10 years. And so therefore the intervention screening costs a couple of thousand dollars which uh, turns out to be $200 a year on an annualized basis. Okay, and I do that calculation because there are different screening intervals. And uh, obviously we don't yet know what the multi-cancer blood test will cost, um, but the expectation is it might cost a couple of hundred dollars for the blood test. You know, then there's imaging that's required in a certain proportion, and this would occur once every two years. So uh, you can see the actual cost is in the ballpark of our existing screening programs. So how about the cost effectiveness of these different screening programs? So just because something is inexpensive doesn't mean that we should buy it. And likewise, some things are quite expensive, but they're very good value and we should uh, choose them. So you can see here, kind of paradoxically, cervical cancer screening is the cheapest annualized cost, but it's not uh, as cost effective as breast and colorectal cancer, uh, perhaps because cervical cancer is much less common than either breast or colorectal. Um, so, but you can see uh, using the threshold value of 50,000 that Three of these are very cost effective. You know, their cost per quality gained is a long way below the threshold. And lung cancer, as long as it's done in very high risk individuals um, at certain ages, is more or less meets the threshold for cost effectiveness. Okay, so there are a lot of factors that go into affecting how cost effective screening is. Okay, so I'll just go briefly through a few of them. So if screening is more costly, as we saw in the previous slide with lung cancer, that makes it often less cost effective. The cost per quality increases. If the screening test is less specific, you know, i.e. it generates a lot of false positives that require additional testing to screen out, that makes these tests less cost effective. And similarly, if the screening test is less sensitive and is not is less likely to pick up uh, actual cancer cases, again, that makes it less cost effective. To make it more cost effective, we can try screening only the higher risk population groups. So you can see um, all of the US uh, guidelines were for populations of at least 50 and older, uh, where incidence of cancer is higher. And if treatment costs are higher, that also makes screening more cost effective um, because we avert late stage cancer treatments that are very expensive and instead substitute lower cost screening. Um, and finally, the younger the at risk population is, the more cost effective screening is because it saves more life years. You know, if you can catch uh, breast cancer in a woman age 50, you're saving more life years 
than if you uh, catch it in a woman who's 85, let's say. Okay, this slide has a lot of information, so please be patient. Um, on the left side, I have listed the incidence of uh, the, the top cancers by, um, by numbers uh, for the US uh, from the global CAN data for, for 2020. And you can see the cancers that we screen for, breast, lung, uh, colon, are right up there as having the highest incidence. But if we move to the second column, the order changes because we can be, we've been more successful at catching and treating early some of the cancers. So you can see breast cancer is no longer the, uh, higher, the, the highest priority by in terms of deaths uh, because we successfully screen and treat. But on the other hand, you can see cancers entering that second column that we didn't see in the first column. Cancers that only occupy a smaller proportion of new cases, but a large proportion of deaths. Um, so you can see pancreas, uh, liver, the upper GI, esophagus and stomach um, in that list. So these are, and, uh, yeah, these are cancers that cause a high proportion of deaths and that may make them higher priorities to try and find a screening test. Uh, that's not the only factor, but that might be one. So in the fifth, in the third column, what I did was to, uh, uh, to calculate the ratio of the proportion of deaths from a cancer by the proportion of incidence. And these are the five cancers where the deaths are twice as important uh, as the incidence. And you might think these are high priorities for a new screening test. Okay, it's not the only factor because likewise also the overall prevalence might matter. But these are five key cancers that we'll see in following in the slides following. Okay, so um, the multi-cancer blood test offers the opportunity to capture cancers that we don't ca capture by current screening. And so the question is, how well does this work? So I've put on this slide some information from this DETECT A trial, uh, which shows you that in a group of 10,000 women uh, examined over and followed up over a year, there were about 100 cancers detected, of which a quarter were detected by regular screening, about half were detected by symptoms, but another quarter could be detected by the multi-cancer blood test scre um, screening modality. And it had some advantages in that um, it was able to detect early, relatively early stage cancers that could be treated with curative intent. And also the um, amount of false positives that involved invasive kinds of follow-up surgery or bronchoscopy was very few, only three cases. Um, the you know, less good news is that the sensitivity of the test was um, acceptable, but obviously uh, would be desirable if it could be higher. Okay, and this uh, slide from Alquist uh, shows you that once the cancer has been detected by the blood test and a, a follow-up screening, that it was reasonably good at detecting the site of the cancer. Okay, and it varies according to the cancer, how good that uh, fit was. Um, but, you know, this, this is a good signal in that it, uh, in, it suggests that people who are uh, detected as having cancer on the blood test, uh, there's a good chance that one can identify the site of it without doing a huge amount of uh, invasive follow-up. Okay, so going back to the priority cancers that I mentioned, um, there are being blood tests being developed as single cancer blood tests currently. Um, so for example, uter uterine cancer and ovarian cancer and gastric cancer. The disadvantage of the single cancer blood tests is that since several of these cancers are fairly rare, that it's not very cost effective to screen single cancers one by one. 
Okay, uterine cancer may be uh, cost effective, but the uh, ovarian cancer would not be unless you pick a very, very high risk population. And the problem with doing that is that you then miss cancers in the lower risk population. I believe that's one of the issues with lung cancer. You can focus on the high risk, highest risk population who have the highest smoking history, um, and it becomes more or less cost effective to do the screening, but you still miss a lot of people whose cancer came about, you know, perhaps because of secondhand smoke or other factors. So the um, advantage uh, of the multi-cancer blood test is what if you could do a single blood test and instead of uh, doing you know 10 different blood tests for 10 different cancers, do one single blood draw and then spread out the costs over detecting more cancers and thereby enabling you to uh, screen for these more rare cancers. So um, this is where we get to the paper that uh, Joe Lipscomb and Christian Tomasetti and uh, Albert Kuo and I wrote. So obviously this new screening test is very new and we don't have a lot of the parameters that we really need to do the full set of calculations. Um, but it was desired to do a early cost effectiveness to know if we would be in the right ballpark and that this might be feasible. And also doing an early calculation allows us to be very precise about which um, parameters we need more information about, i.e. where are the priorities for doing further research to refine our calculations. So what we modeled here is as if there were three baskets of cancers with different characteristics, and we picked two that for which there was no test currently um, in, uh, for which there are guidelines, and one that for which there already are guidelines and it already exists as a test, um, but it still it doesn't uh, manage to screen the whole population. So we had to make some assumptions, you know, based on what data we can find um, about how sensitive these tests are, and it varies according to the cancer. Um, in the fourth column, you can see the data on what the assumed survival gains are if it can be detected early, and it varies across these cancers. And based on that, we could do we could get um, information as to what the co cost effectiveness of these intervention of these screening would be um, if we did single cancer blood tests. Okay, and what you can see here is that if uterine cancer were done as a single cancer blood test, it probably would meet the threshold for cost effectiveness, but for the other two, it would not unless you could pick a very, very high risk population and restrict the test to that. Okay, so what we then did is redid our calculations, not cancer by cancer, but testing all uh, the population for all of these three baskets of cancer at once and it redid the calculations. And the result is basically that the cost effectiveness of the combined test, the multi-cancer blood test, will be lower than the cost of any of the individual three cancers. Um, and we can then actually compare it to the threshold as well. So in this case, um, the uterine cancer as a single test had the lowest cost, had the best cost effectiveness number. And the combined multi-cancer blood test had an even better performance. So I think that's on the next uh, slide here. And it shows you that the cost effectiveness for the multi-cancer blood test, which can um, in, uh, you know, potentially get information on up to eight different cancers, um, is definitely in the ballpark. It's, uh, our estimates are around 25,000 per quali. Um, but that also allows for some sensitivity analysis that it might not be quite as good as we predict, you know, if some of the parameters were different. And it's certainly very comparable to the current threshold, the current cost effectiveness of existing lung cancer screening. You know, so the, this was our encouraging results for moving forward uh, with further development of a multi-cancer blood test. 
Okay, there are a lot of limitations of our findings. It was a very complex thing to do, even when we limit this to three cancers. And ultimately, you know, there may be eight to 10 cancers which are involved. There are some cancers like pancreatic and ovarian about which we may know less because we currently can't detect them very early. Um, and also treatment regimes may not be very well developed as yet. There are also concerns about existing screening. Um, if you ask people to come and be screened with a blood draw, is that going to interfere with their compliance with breast cancer screening or with uh, colon cancer screening? That would be bad if people don't uh, come for these other screenings because we know that uh, blood cancer, uh, blood cancer, sorry, we know that blood testing is less good for e both breast and colon cancer because we have more direct ways of testing for those. Um, we know that colonoscopy can detect precancers, as can breast cancer screening, whereas blood testing is less likely to detect precancer. The other possibility is that uh, there are people in the population who don't like invasive tests like mammography or colonoscopy, but who might be more willing to come and be tested um, if all that's required is a blood draw initially. Um, and I don't know how the figures are for the US, but in Ontario, up to a third of the risk at risk population are not up to date with their screening. Um, in the future, we plan to extend this model, not simply to a one time only screen at age 50, but to model what happens if you test the population, you know, let's say between 50 and 70 every two years. And also, we didn't uh, separate by sex. Uterine cancer, you know, which is the relatively cost effective cancer, isn't uh, important in men. And therefore, the estimates probably have to be disaggregated for men and women. And also, a new, cost, a new um, screening test may impact cost effectiveness of the existing test because you're duplicating some of the screening. Anyway, just to conclude, uh, these are my opinions. My view is it's unlikely that the multi-cancer blood test would displace uh, screening for breast and co colon cancers for the reason I mentioned about not being able to detect precancers. Um, I think the multi-cancer blood uh, test is also unlikely to be important as yet in low and lower middle income countries um, because they do not have facilities for treating cancers once they're identified. And also they don't have access uh, that's broad enough for the imaging that's required for the confirmatory testing. Um, and I think there's going to be more research needed and more treatment options developed if the multi-cancer blood test allows us to detect early stage cancers uh, for some of the existing um, cancers where the, the death rates are unusually high relative to the um, prevalence. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Steve, Ruth, and Sue, thank you for those such tremendous presentations. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, our chance to talk together. I want to remind everybody that you can ask questions and comment by clicking the Q&A icon on the bottom right of your screen. Please do that. We're, we're watching your uh, comments uh, and questions. Uh, we're going to try to get to as many questions as time allows. But we're going to start by learning a little bit about you. Uh, our audience and your thoughts on actually getting a multi-cancer blood test. Uh, so uh, we're going to uh, open up a polling question uh, and uh, take a look at uh, your responses, and then they're going to enter those responses for me to see. Uh, and uh, I'll read the question and the choices to you. Uh, if a multi-cancer blood test were available to you today, would you get the test? The answer, one, yes. Two, likely I would, but I'd like to know more about it first. 
three, probably, but I'd want to know what other people think uh, and plan to do. Four, hmm, I want to make sure it works like it's supposed to. Or five, no. So those are your five choices. Would you get the test today? So uh, please uh, respond to the poll when you see it. And then when uh, we have enough responses, uh, so here's uh, here's the response I just put in. This is really, I think, very interesting. Uh, the responses we got so far: sixty-three percent said yes, they would do it; a twenty-five percent likely; five uh, percent uh, probably; six percent or that. And nobody just said no. So uh, I, I think the the public appeal. Uh, of this concept of a blood test to screen for multi multiple cancers is very, very high, which I think puts even more onus on making sure that the value is there, uh, that you know, the value in terms of outcomes, the value in terms of cost effectiveness. Uh, so thank you for that. Put your questions in. I I'm going to kick us off, but uh, keep the questions coming. Uh, so, uh, Steve, let me start with you. You know, yeah. you just spent so many years studying this particular screening. Uh, and you did not find the result in mortality reduction that you were hoping and anticipating, and yet you began your talk, I am an eternal optimist about screening. So help us understand your thinking about that. Um, mainly because uh, we have eight examples where it works really well. Uh, colorectal cancer has got to be uh, the top, uh, I think, in, in my book. Um, as uh, uh, Dr. Horton pointed out, it is the most cost effective. And, and that's a combination of reasons. Um, the cancer has a long duration, we believe. Um, so there's a great opportunity over many years to detect it. There are lots of methods to detect it. Um, there's stool tests, uh, there's colonoscopy, there's, so there's imaging tests, and, and then there's biospecimen tests. Um, that, uh, that, that gives a lot of flexibility. Uh, and, and then we have um, positive results for prostate, lung, and uh, breast cancer. Uh, so I think it's just a matter of time and uh, energy and, and research uh, to um, address this for the cancers that don't have current screening methods. And it's just uh, limited by our ingenuity and, and our biological understanding of these other cancers. Um, so I continue, despite my uh, uh, experience, uh, to be an eternal optimist for early detection. I think there is a great deal uh, of opportunity here because if there is an impact, if you do find it early, um, my belief is, although I don't have empirical data for it, is that you cure the patient. And that's very different from treatment of late stage disease where you can extend survival a couple of years. Uh, okay. you, you might cure and give them a 20 years. So it's a combination of the big impact um, and, and just the positive results we've seen in multiple different cancers. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Steve. You know, Sue, I, I wanted to, to jump to, maybe it's too detailed, but I think it's an important question that some of the emerging technologies, uh, as Ruth talked about, can do a pretty darn good job at indicating the, the, the organ of origin of the cancer, which would then not lead everybody getting a PET CT to kind of take a broad look. It might take a very focused uh, diagnostic pathway. How might that, have you thought in your team of how that might affect the cost effectiveness if it were quite accurate to give organ of origin? Uh, I think it would all depend on the parameters. Um, how often would you have to do the test? I mean, uh, the test for ovarian cancer, where you're screening people every four months, you know, that, that's quite a short interval, and people might not be very good at doing that. Um, so I think in the absence of other information, uh, I don't know. I mean, PET, PET CT at least doesn't involve anything, you know, like a, an endoscopy or a bronchoscopy, which is quite invasive. You know, it's no fun and it's expensive, but 
it's not like having you know uh things stuck down your throat uh so uh, I, th I, I i don't have a good answer but it's a good yeah. question yeah the uh it, it's uh you know i think that the fact that we're not just talking about one new approach to blood testing you know there's a number of products that are being looked at some have different performance uh so let uh this is a, a question from uh uh the, the audience and then i have a few more as someone who's had a history of a blood cancer hodgkin's lymphoma over 15 years do you think we're at an advanced enough stages in medical breakthrough to allow for those of us with blood cancer history oh to, oh that's a to, to be allowed to donut donate blood that's a somewhat different question let, let me put that on hold because that's not so much about the screening maybe we have time to revisit it um ruth let me let me talk to you about uh you know, you and I have thought very similarly when I saw your presentation about these emerging technologies. Um, and a couple of questions occur to me. One is this issue of shifting the stage from four to three, from three to two. That's somewhat different than detecting latent disease before, uh, you know, there are any symptoms, which was normally what we look for. I mean, uh, certainly in screening, but you can have stage two disease without symptoms, certainly, or even some later disease. Do you think that's going to be a significant advantage, this stage shift, not just to very early disease or even pre-cancer, but possibly finding a, a stage two as opposed to a stage three? Uh, that's so, um, so that's very difficult to say. Because um, we, you know, when you look at the survival curves for these cancers, it would seem that you should have an advantage. You know, survival for stage two is generally better than for three, and generally better for four. But the comparison of that survival is not a fair comparison, because the survival uh, for a stage um, um, for the survival for that stage um, three cancer and now you compare it to stage two, the stage two is detected at a different time point, right? So you're looking at, at the stage two from the time it was detected, and what you really need to do is compare that stage two from the time it got to stage three. Once it gets to stage three, do we have a survival advantage? Those comparisons tend to be over-optimistic is what I'll say. So it's really hard to know you kind of have this, um, you have this this problem, we might call it a problem of lead time in the stage specific comparisons of survival. Can I um, make a comment though I, on the 63%? So I, 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 I completely understand the allure of this technology and I completely understand Steve's optimism and I too have worked in early detection for a long time. I just think that um, there's two things. First of all, um, it's, it's, it's a lot more um, nuanced uh, some cancers, just like some cancers are treatable, I think some cancers are more screenable than others. And, and I think that when we think about ca the cancers themselves being detected early, it seems like a no-brainer. But we have to intervene in an entire population to find those cancers and detect it earlier. Screening touches everybody. And a lot of people have been touched by screening and not helped. So we're, rather than thinking only about benefit, we have to recognize that in population screening, we're walking a fine line. That's what makes it interesting. Yeah, so, uh, absolutely. So there's a question in the, in the chat about, uh, would these be helpful in hereditary cancers where, that are outside of the routine screening guidelines? And one of the, quote, advantages of that is that you might find a higher risk population, which could change your predictive value. So open that up to the panel. Um, let me just take a, a, a brief uh, answer that the hereditary cancers are usually specific for a cancer site. So, for example, um, BRCA1 and 2 are high risk for both breast and ovary, but not for, other not for most other cancers. So I, I, I would think that for hereditary cancers, you're still going to be more focused on single or maybe uh, multi, uh, two uh, cancers at a time rather than, say, 20 cancers all at once with one blood test. Um, so I, I, I think the MCT test 
is really designed for the entire population of normal risk, um, mostly you know, 40, 45 uh, and over um, population where most of the cancers occur. So could I add something? Sure, uh, sure. At the moment, the suggestion would be that the multi-cancer blood test would be done perhaps every two years in the same, pretty much the same interval age-wise as uh, exists for colon and uh, for breast. But, you know, suppose you t uh, timed it such that you did your multi-cancer blood test off cycle, you know, in the alternate year between your mammography and, you know, what else? I mean, then you might get some benefit. But uh, I, I'm not. I don't know enough to say how benefit how uh, large that benefit would be. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. So, Ruth, uh, you know, you and I have been in the in the screening guideline business for a lot of years, and I've asked myself, how are we going to evaluate a multi-target blood test to be to make it into a guideline? Uh, you know, what what threshold are we going to need? And you certainly alluded to the the need for trials, but I, 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 I wonder if you've thought about how that process might look. Well, I definitely think that's what we need. Um, but, you know, I, I, um, I think we need, it's, remember, it's not just about the test. We need a very clear uh, guidance about what to do after the test. We need to um, really evaluate this because there are kind of hidden dangers here, for example, um, of incidental findings with whole body PET CT, um, and, you know, you have a positive test, but your, your CT doesn't show anything, and now you, you don't know, do you have cancer or not? So really, really, I feel like this is a freight train, and this is a, a time for us to really learn um, about the complexities of screening and just to be cautious as we go forward. And I fully anticipate that our guidelines panels like the American Cancer Society and the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force will not be ready to issue recommendations on this technology for quite some time. So we, we, we only have a minute left, so I'm gonna, uh, uh, I'll uh, attempt a quick wrap up uh, of, of what we've talked about. So, uh, you know, this, uh, the technology is remarkable uh, and, and we shouldn't diminish that. And, and I think as Ruth just alluded to and, and it reflected in the polling, it becomes very attractive. You know, the thought you could get a blood test to screen for, for numerous cancers. And we, we saw some, uh, some evidence that, uh, that it could well be cost effective, but that just assumes that it ultimately is effective. And, and I think Ruth really emphasized the importance of looking at the outcomes that matter the most. Uh, uh, and, and Steve presented, uh, you know, how to go about, I mean, they did it the right way, right? They, they really, found the technology and they did the trial and they answered these important questions, but it's a big investment. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, everyone recognizes that the potentially the greatest promise here is what Sue mentioned and what the polling shows us. People are gonna be willing to have this test. Uh, that, uh, that's that freight train effect though that, that Ruth has talked about. We have to make sure that willingness to have it translates into really good outcome. So thank you so much uh, to, to Steve, to Sue, to Ruth, uh, to, to the Dialogue to Prevent Cancer for an excellent uh, presentation. We really appreciate everybody's participation uh, and uh, uh, want to thank you for being a part of it. And also recommend that uh, 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 we don't want you to disappear. We want you to stay right here because coming up next, is the presentations of our 2021 Cancer Prevention Laurels Award uh, with our MC Andrea Roan. We'll be honoring three individuals who've done a, an enormous amount for cancer prevention and early detection. And these awards are presented by the Prevent Cancer Foundation and by the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. So thank you so much again to our panel, to the audience for being a part of this dialogue. And really we invite and encourage all of you to stay aboard and uh, uh, listen in on our uh, Laurel's presentations. Thanks again. Hello, and thank you for joining me at the Laurel's Awards, part of the 2021 Prevent Cancer Dialogue. 
These awards are presented annually from the Prevent Cancer Foundation in partnership with the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. My name is Andrea Rohn, and I'm a longtime board member and supporter of the Prevent Cancer Foundation, and it's my honor to present the 2021 Laurels Awards. The laurel has long been a symbol of tribute, honor, victory, merit, and reward. That's why the Prevent Cancer Foundation chose the laurel to represent our winners and the remarkable contributions they've made to cancer prevention and early detection. As you'll soon hear, our award winners are not only esteemed experts in their fields, but dedicated individuals who inspire all of us with their passion and perseverance. Now it's my pleasure to present the first award for the Laurel for Increasing Health Equity Through Innovation to Dr. Su Yin Wu. In her role as Director of the Healthy Asian Americans Project and Center for Health Disparities Innovation and Studies at Eastern Michigan University, Dr. Su Yin Wu is a researcher, professor, and community advocate. She has worked tirelessly to provide evidence and data to support the urgent need for public health funding for underserved Asian communities. The statistics and findings in her research have revealed pervasive health disparities for Asians and Asian Americans. Dr. Wu has led her team in building a culture of health and implementing best practices for culturally sensitive programs that promote breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screenings among Asian Americans. Globally, Dr. Wu has implemented strategies such as training breast health ambassadors that have resulted in thousands of women receiving breast cancer screening and follow-up diagnostics and treatment. She has been an extraordinary role model in her vision and leadership in addressing health disparities in cancer screening and prevention. On behalf of the Prevent Cancer Foundation and the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable, I am proud to recognize Dr. Su Yin Wu today with the 2021 Cancer Prevention Laurel for Increasing Health Equity Through Innovation. Her demonstrated leadership and dedication in cancer prevention has made a world of difference. Thank you, Dr. Wu, for your persistence, collaboration, and innovation. Next up is our Laurel for Dedication to Community Service, presented to Ms. Ify Ann Wabuku, a woman who I know well from serving with her on the Georgetown Lombardi Community Advisory Council. Ms. Wabuku is the president and founder of African Women's Cancer Awareness Association based in Washington, DC. For the past 16 years, she has been dedicated to identifying and meeting the community needs for cancer prevention and screening, working to reduce disparities in awareness, education, prevention, and access to treatment and care for African immigrant women. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Ms. Wabuku re-strategized and raised $150,000 to continue serving the breast cancer community. She has distributed personal protective equipment to Black breast cancer survivors and families, coordinated virtual public health outreaches, and ensured Black women in the community are receiving the patient navigation services and mental health support they need. She knows firsthand what these women need because she is a breast cancer survivor who lost her mother and best friend to breast cancer. She has dedicated her life to encouraging early detection and screening for breast cancer. On behalf of the Prevent Cancer Foundation, I am proud to recognize Ify Ann Wabuku today with the 2021 Cancer Prevention Laurel for dedication to community service. Her commitment to education and screening services for medically underserved communities is saving lives. Thank you, Ms. Wabuku, for your unwavering commitment, passion, and service. Now it's my distinct honor to present the Laurel for National Leadership posthumously to Dr. David Alquist. Dr. Alquist was a gastroenterologist who knew the biggest impact he could make on colorectal cancer was through improved early detection. He led a scientific team in optimizing molecular probes to separate fragments of human DNA from massive amounts of bacterial DNA. The result was an FDA-approved multi-target stool test to screen for colorectal cancer. Dr. Alquist's long career included many breakthrough ways of thinking. He had more than 25 years of continuous funding from the National Institutes of Health, more than 200 peer-reviewed manuscripts and book chapters, and more than 80 issued patents. 
He was guided by his North Star of reducing the cancer burden and was fueled by creativity, humility, and mission drive entrepreneurialism. Dr. Alquist died on November 1st, 2020 due to complications from ALS. On behalf of the Prevent Cancer Foundation, I am proud to honor Dr. Alquist posthumously with the 2021 Cancer Prevention Laurel in National Leadership. His wife, Susan Alquist, and colleague, Dr. Paul Limburg, are accepting the award on his behalf. Thank you, Andrea, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to the Prevent Cancer Foundation for recognizing Dr. David Alquist, my colleague, mentor, and friend with this truly special award. I was fortunate enough to have known Dave for over two decades. And in addition to being a compassionate clinician, first and foremost, he was a visionary leader and a pioneering innovator in the field of cancer early detection. Dave was always eager to take on new challenges, particularly those with high potential to transform or disrupt the status quo. With the goal of reducing cancer incidence, mortality, and suffering as his steadfast North, North Star, Dave navigated uncharted territories to find exceptional opportunities in unexpected spaces. Perhaps most notably, his tireless efforts to discover, develop, and deliver a better test for colorectal cancer screening resulted in the FDA-approved multi-target stool DNA assay known as Coligard, as Andrea mentioned, which has been used by over 5 million people to date. More recently, Dave embarked on another quest to fundamentally change cancer early detection by moving from a single organ to a multi-organ approach. These exciting activities and efforts are ongoing, catalyzed by the seminal research generated from the Alquist Lab. Throughout his career, Dave sought out creative collaborations and productive partnerships to accelerate progress, whether with colleagues from halfway down the hall or halfway around the world. Without fail, Dave recognized and respected these diverse perspectives gained through these relationships and celebrated their collective accomplishments as team-driven success. I'll close my comments by expressing both my professional and personal gratitude for all of Dave's outstanding contributions, which have had such a tremendously positive impact on his patients, his peers, and public health overall. With that, I'll turn it to Susan Alquist for her reflections. Thank you, Paul. Your generous tribute to friendship <clears throat> and understanding of Dave mean more than you can know. On behalf of our family, I offer heartfelt thanks to Bo Aldiger and the Prevent Cancer Foundation for this recognition of Dave's life's work and legacy. Dave would particularly want to acknowledge you, Bo, for your visionary leadership, tireless efforts, and significant accomplishments. And to have the award presented by you, Andrea, is a special honor. You live what this award represents. I know that Dave would be humbled to be among this impressive group of past and present Laurel Award recipients working to change the world. Congratulations to Drs. Wu and Wabuku. Many of you knew Dave as a colleague and a friend. He was an adventurer, a risk taker, and a committed iconoclast. His sense of curiosity and wonder made his life journey remarkable and full of surprises. He was a storyteller whose vision and passion drew others in to possibilities. Our family called Dave round the next Bend Alquist in his life and in his work. He, in his life and in his work, he never stopped exploring. He was endlessly intrigued by what might lie just around the next bend, stepping toward the unknown, his favorite place to be. It was in nature, holding a fly rod or flying down a ski trail, that many of the ideas he's being recognized for today took shape. Dave lived with vision-guided purpose every day and made every interaction count. His drive for excellence and transformation were matched only by his commitment to the integrity of the science and the needs of patients. He never used the word I when referring to his work, always acknowledging the we that it takes to accomplish meaningful change. As Paul said, successes are the team's success. Challenges are faced together, always moving forward. There was no there for Dave ever. And he knew that realizing a vision requires an integrated continuum of committed people and organizations. 
Dave had the privilege of spending his career at Mayo Clinic. He was part of dedicated and passionate research teams both at Mayo Clinic and with Kevin Conroy and the team at Exact Sciences. Through that partnership and shared vision and the exciting ongoing work with many around the country and the world, lives are being saved and forever changed. While he would have loved to be here to see his vision become reality, Dave closed his eyes grateful for the opportunities he had to make a difference. He felt hopeful knowing that talented, visionary, and committed people would face the daunting challenges, see opportunities, and find successes in ways he couldn't know but imagined every day. We carry him with us into that very bright future. Thank you for honoring Dave in this meaningful way. Congratulations to the other Laurel Award winners and best wishes to all of you on the journey ahead. Thank you. Susan and Paul, thank you. And know that we will always remember Dr. Alquist for his progressive thinking, scientific curiosity and exemplary leadership. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us for the Laurel Awards at the third Prevent Cancer Dialogue webcast. We hope to see all of you next year at the 2022 Prevent Cancer Dialogue for more great conversation on trends, innovations, and updates in cancer prevention and screening. Goodbye.